Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Barbara Cochran. I'm the director of the Duternier Center here in the School of Nursing. Um, and today I'm also representing the Northwest Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Center, which is sponsoring this Geriatric Healthcare Lecture Series. I do want to mention that um, this is the second to the last lecture for this winter term. We will be offering another lecture series spring term, which will start up, I uh, can't remember the exact date now, I'm sorry, um, but it will be end of March, beginning of April, I believe. Um, and you should have that information. If not, check in with, um, you can just email nwgwec at uw.edu for information. And we will get that posted on our website pretty quickly, too. Um, that lecture series will be another um, group of 10 lectures focused for a spring term on Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So um, I know that um, that focus has been popular among um, attendees of our lecture series. We'll be updating a few lectures as well as um, adding some new ones. Today, however, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Tan Ong. Um, he's a clinical educator in geriatrics at the University of Washington Harborview Medical Center. Dr. Ong is committed to promoting and providing education in geriatric medicine and gerontology. His interests include patient capacity assessments, sexuality in older adults, palliative care, and long-term care topics, many of which he's focused on in these, this lecture series um, over the years. And central to his interest is improving medical care for the older population through advancements in medical education at the undergraduate and graduate levels and including um, interprofessional education. So welcome. Dr. Ong is going to be talking about delirium in older adults. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Tan Ong, just like what Barbara was saying. Uh, yeah, you did an excellent job. Um, just to give, give you a little bit of background on this talk, um, we'll be talking about delirium in older adults. For the most part, we'll be talking about delirium in hospitalized older adults, just because that's where a good majority of the literature lies. But just like what Barb was saying in terms of my background, I practice in all types of different environments. And I practice in the long-term care environment. I uh, do hospice care, and, and I also do home visits. Um, and so you'll see me talk uh, and pull delirium through those different clinical environments, too. And there will be um, snapshots, and I am open up uh, for questions towards the end as well. Okay. So I have no disclosures, no conflict of interest with the industry or research. And hopefully by the end of this discussion, that we'll, you'll be able to identify delirium in older adults. And then presented with different risk factors, that you'll be able to identify what those risk factors are in older adults for developing this condition. And more importantly, you'll be able to list some preventative interventions uh, for older adults at risk. And then if an individual does develop the condition, develop a plan of management as well. So we'll start off with a clinical example. This is an 82-year-old woman who lives in a nursing home. She had a prior uh, cerebral vascular accident, and now she's hospitalized for pneumonia. At the time of admission, when she is admitted to the medical surgical floor, the nurses note that she's pleasant and she's A and O times three. And unfortunately, the exam next day shows that she's a little different now. Her vital signs are still stable, and she has findings that are very much consistent with her pneumonia on the right side. And she also has those changes that were associated with her old cerebral vascular accident. At the time of this assessment in the morning, she awakens to her name, but she closes her eyes for long periods during her interview. She's tired, and she doesn't really want to talk. And then you notice that she's easily distracted by the noises that appear out in the hallway. So questions are constantly being repeated at this point in time. And she thinks that she's in a, in a hotel versus actually being in the hospital. And she appears restless at times when awake, and she's picking at her bedding. The only new medication that is added that is new is the antibiotic that uh, she was started on to treat her pneumonia. So obviously, this is a discussion about delirium. And so this is a, a picture painting a, a patient that has delirium, particularly in the hospitalized setting. And before we, we move on and have a more um, nuanced discussion about it, 
think it's important to talk about what delirium is. And one of the standards that we can use is to using the DSM-5 criteria. And these are some of those components of what it is it, um, delirium is and how to diagnose someone with delirium. And one of the most important features of delirium is that there's a um, there's inattention, there's disturbed level of consciousness with a reduced ability to focus, very similar to that example that we had talked about in the previous slide. And the attention is shifts from one topic to the next, or even shifting in terms of altered level of consciousness. And then in our uh, example, this woman didn't have any change in perceptual disturbance, but what that refers to is possibly developing hallucinations seeing things that aren't there. Usually, it's oftentimes visual. And the, another important aspect of delirium is that it's an acute onset, and it's also fluctuating in course. That was not captured in our previous slide. But most definitely, this was a departure from where her baseline was, though. And that's one of the important distinguishing factors from dementia versus delirium. It's a departure from a person's baseline. So it's very much an acute and onset that we'll talk a little bit more about in a little bit. And more importantly as well, that there's some sort of evidence that there's an organic cause, that there's a physical cause that is contributing to a person's delirium or altered level of consciousness. Okay. But more importantly than the DSM-5 criteria are a list of behaviors and symptoms that I think that is, is probably much more important uh, from a clinical level, is that I don't go around with the DSM-5 criteria in my back pocket and looking for the condition. But in fact, I pay attention to some of the changes in behaviors and the symptoms. And I think it's important because when I'm doing um, clinical care over the phone or I'm talking about it in team meetings in hospice, for example, I'm asking in my team members if there are these behaviors and symptoms that are observed. Again, acute, and this is in alphabetical order, but acute and onset just happens to fall right at the top, which is very, very important. And there's an agitation component that's uh, associated with it. Very similar to the, our, how we opened up with the example of that 82-year-old woman from the nursing home. She had psychomotor activity that was very much increased, picking at her bedding, for example. There was an ultra level of consciousness where she was falling and drifting back into sleep, even during your mid-interview very, very um, uh, uh, signs that are very much consistent with uh, delirium. There's confusion and delusions, which is very, very different from, um, that can be also um, different from hallu the hallucinations that a person can have, which falls later down along the list. So the delusions itself oftentimes are of paranoia. And it's usually fixed around feelings of uh, an unsafe environment. And we can go on throughout this entire list, but I think it's important to, to look at this list and looking for those behaviors and symptoms uh, that are associated with delirium. The other thing that I'll make an argument for is delirium is incredibly common if you're looking for it. 70% of older adults who are admitted to the general internal medicine wards in any given hospital, 30% of those individuals will have delirium. 50% of these individuals have it at time that they're admitted to the hospital, and another half of those individuals who develop it um, within the hospital course. And as, as you see within these bullet points, as a person gets a little bit sicker and sicker, delirium becomes more and more common. So for example, in the post-op period, it's, it's very prevalent to as high as a quarter of our patients. And this is talking about elective cases. So these are cases that are very much planned. But when these are urgent or emergent cases, they can be at as high as 50% of individuals who are post-surgical that delirium can occur in. And within the skilled nursing facilities, that it's even higher than that. Up to 60% of individuals have been shown to be delirious at time of assessment. And as a person progresses to becoming sicker and sicker in terms of the intensive care unit or even at end of life, then it can as high as 75 to 80% and even above that in some studies. And although delirium is incredibly common, unfortunately it's under-recognized. Under -recognized. 
up to 80% of cases are actually missed. Nurses who provide the most of the care for patients within the hospitalized setting, particularly the delirious ones, miss up to 20% of cases. Physicians do equally as bad. And so in all, all healthcare providers, we miss out on these cases. And partly, you'll ask yourself, well, why is that the case? Part of it is the fluctuating nature of things. For example, in nurses and the physicians now, we spend less time at the bedside, and so we might not be capturing this, the fact that they're actually fluctuating in, in nature. And then there's also limited education and the importance of why delirium is, uh, should be recognized. And the, more importantly, which we'll talk about later, is that there's your standardized assessment tools, but these aren't routinely used unless it's a system levels approach. And then lastly, that there's a lack of a conceptual understanding. Well, what is the cause of delirium? Because as what we were saying in the DSM-4 criteria is that there needs to be some organic cause, but there, there's a lack of understanding. Well, what are these causes? And so we'll talk a little bit about more about that as well. And then, then the very last bullet, that there's a likeness of delirium and dementia that we'll talk about in future slides as well. So these are some of the reasons why it goes under recognized. Another common reason that we'll talk about in a future slide is that hypoactive delirium, of course, is a more of a prevalent form, and we'll distinguish between what that means in uh, future slides. Not only is it common and it's under-recognized, unfortunately it leads to poor outcomes in many of our older adults. So it increases more mortality in our older patients, where 62% of patients who develop delirium in a hospitalized setting have, excuse me, if an older adult develops delirium in a hospitalized setting, it, their mortality at the one-year level can be as high as 60%. So incredibly high, increases the risk of infections, such as pneumonia and urinary tract infections by two odds fold. Same thing with the sniff placement. So more likely that a person who develops delirium in the hospitalized setting, more likely that they'll be placed into a nursing home at that point. There's usually also an associated decline in function where an individual lose a whole activities of daily, daily living. And there's a, a decline in cognition that oftentimes, as a medical student, I was taught, well, sometimes it's reversible and easily reversible. But as I practice in clinical medicine and as some of these literature shows, it's not entirely reversible, and sometimes it's not as easily as reversible, where impaired cognition can be as persistent at down at six months to 12 months. And so this is a similar study, or a study that, that uh, supports that, that delirium can cause prolonged cognitive impairment. And what this study looked at was at, at um, patients who were elective cardiac surgery. And so they took their mini mental status score. And so that's what you see on that y-axis. And then on the x-axis, the, uh, the time before surgery and days after surgery. The black line represents those individuals who de did not develop delirium versus the group that de developed delirium when, when they were hospitalized. So these were perfectly well-to-do patients who were undergoing cardiac surgery because they had coronary artery disease or they we're getting a valve replacement. And it shows that there was clearly that there was a prolonged period of time of decrease in, in cognitive function compared to those individuals who didn't develop delirium. And so um, it's one of those things that has, um, that has become more important and recognized, particularly when I'm caring for someone in the nursing home and I'm educating patients, family members. The, what you're seeing in front of you is that your, your family member is acutely delirious. It's something that we're trying to reverse, but some of the cognitive impairment can be persistent for long periods of time. And when that resolves, I don't really know. There's a huge cost to our healthcare system, too, where at least in 2011 dollars, it was $164 billion. Just to put it in perspective, that was how much it took to care for patients with, with diabetes and falls combined. And so there's a huge cost associated with, for the healthcare providers that are in the room, or if you've had a loved one who has been hospitalized and has had this condition, it makes sense. People who have this condition stay in the hospital longer, 
and they have other complications that happen because they stay in the hospital longer. So the hospital costs go up extraordinarily high. Okay. So in summary, the significance of delirium, it's very common, particularly in the hospital setting. And it gets more and more common as a person gets more and more sick, and particularly in different care environments as well. It's often under-recognized and diagnosed by all. And it's an independent risk factor for all those things that we talk about in terms of mortality, nursing home placement, functional decline, and cognitive decline as well. So we're going to return back to our, our case. Our, so the, this hospital day number three, and the overnight physician is called. And the reason why the person that the physician was called was now that she is more delirious. She's pulled out her IV. She's incredibly confused now. And the physician orders Haldol, 0.5 milligrams, to be given. And now her antibiotics are changed as well to PO antibiotics because she's lost her IV access. And in the afternoon uh, now, there's a daytime physician that comes in and assesses the, uh, our, our case. And she's without any complaints. In fact, she doesn't even remember what happened. It's a, really a distant dream to her. Her vitals are, appear here, which are relatively unremarkable and stable. You notice that she's still sleepy, but easily arousable, and there's some scattered wheezing that she's being treated for. Her laboratory values are here. A little, her sodium's a little low. Her white count's a little high. Um, but it's pretty much un, unremarkable. And this is what the physician note looks like. And the reason why I'm pulling this out is that when Barbara was introducing me, I, I work with medical students and I work with residents too. And so one of the things that I try to um, teach is that it's important to bring delirium up to the forefront. So this is an actual note and this was an actual patient that the medical resident was caring for. And copy and pasted forward, nowhere does delirium appear on the problem. And it's incredibly important because of the associated outcomes as, as well. So we're not capturing the severity of the acuity and the severity of our patient care. But in fact, it's actually recommended as part of the daily physical exam by all these societies that, are recon that, that, uh, that teach um, physicians. I'm not sure about the nursing society. And then I'll turn to Barb to, to, to give me input on this. But as part of the daily physical exam, all hospitalized older adults, that it should be assessed and documented whether or not delirium is present. And what I would move beyond that, actually, is not to only document the presence, but actually to document its absence, too. Because the absence, because in the healthcare system that we are in, it's incredibly fragmented, not only from the episodes of care, but also healthcare providers. There's shifts of workers that we have now. So I think it's incredibly important to not only document its presence, but also to document the absence of delirium as well, as we're handing off a patient to, for the next person who's coming off to care for an, an individual. Okay, And how should we document this? Well, there's an easy way that, well, that we could do it, using some sort of standardized screening method. Whatever screening method you prefer, that's OK, but just use it. And if you're in a hospital system that's already using a standardized screening tool, great. Utilize that. What I'm presenting to you is the confusion assessment method for further on known as the CAM. It's one of the better studied ones, and this is what it includes. Very similar to the, the signs and the behaviors that we talked about. It includes acute and fluctuating course. A person has to have the inattention that we had talked about, plus either three or four, so either disorganized thinking or an altered level of consciousness. If you have one and two, and one of the items of three and four, then it's a slam dunk that this person has delirium. And it, this is by far the best evidence supports the use of CAM here. And uh, for those of you who are um, familiar with this, the likelihood ratios are quite excellent. So if someone screens positive, using the CAM, it's highly likely that they have delirium. So the positive likelihood ratio is near 10. And they found that the mini mental status score was the least useful. There are others out there as all this alphabet soup that's down at the bottom here. 
There's many others, but what I would encourage you, you to do is not to use the mini mental, as that it was the least useful, and to pick one of these ones that are listed here. And if you have the choice of using the CAM, the CAM is, is the one that I would prefer as well. Not only is the CAM used in multiple different settings, particularly in the hospitalized setting, but it's actually incorporated into the long-term care setting as well. And so for those of you who practice in the long-term care setting, you're very familiar with the minim minimum data set. And so it's a quality indicator that's required by the federal government for a, if you receive Medicare funds, um, that you do this assessment in your, your residents who live there. And this is what they have to do. The CAM is actually part of the minimum data set. So it's, it's already there. And actually now, the CAM has been in, adapted to create a CAM S, which the S stands for the severity. It makes sense that, the, that when you have a, a medical condition that there's different grades of severity, very similar to congestive heart failure or COPD or cognitive impairment, for example. The same thing is true for delirium. So you could have a mild case, moderate case, or severe cases of it as well. And so that's what the CAM S is, is meant to do is to link it to important clinical outcomes to the, based upon the severity of delirium. There's a short form and the long form. And because I'm focused on clinical medicine, I love short forms just because it's much shorter. Um, and so this is an example of what the short form looks like. Still, it focuses in on those four important key aspects of the CAM. The acute, on, on, uh, acute onset and the fluctuating course, yes or no. The inattention, so now in the inattention, you could have a mild form and a marked form and disorganized thinking. Again, the mild or marked and the altered level of consciousness. Either it's normal, you could be mild where they're vigilant or hypervigilant or lethargic or versus a very much marked altered level of consciousness where they have stupor or a coma. And then it's graded onto a severity score there as well. Sorry, went the wrong way. And what this just illustrates is that, very similar to what we talked about before, is that it's linked to important clinical outcomes. And so what you have here is death or nursing home residents at the 90-day period, and also related to functional decline. So what you here have here is the CAM short form. So no delirium, low severity of delirium, moderate severity, and high, as you can see, that the higher it is, or the more severe forms of delirium, that there's a higher relative risk of developing death or having death or being institutionalized, being in a nursing home at the 90-day period, which makes complete sense. And the likewise, you see that as well with associated with functional decline at 30 days. So that's why I actually, actually prefer using the CAM, is that you could link it in terms of severity, and also it's linked to very much important clinical outcomes as well, such as nursing home residents and functional decline at the 30 days and at the 90 days. So we'll talk about a different case. So we'll move on from our initial case. This is a pre-op assessment for those of, of, of you who have loved ones who might be going into surgery or are taking care of individuals who uh, are post-surgical or you have an 81-year-old male who has a history of high blood pressure and coronary artery disease. This gentleman has had a stent in 2009 and is a type 2 diabetic and with high cholesterol. And he unfortunately suffered a ground level fall and fractured his right elbow. And he's being seen in the emergency room. His past medical history is consistent for osteoarthritis and hearing loss, cataracts and glaucoma. And he has poor vision, uh, which is 20 to 100. Uh, with his vision. The medications are listed there where he's on an aspirin. He's on a diuretic combination there, a beta blocker called metoprolol, lisinopril, which is a blood pressure medication, metformin, and glipizide. Both those medications are to treat his diabetes. His social history, he drinks one glass of wine uh, with his dinner, and he, uh, before this fall, was completely independent with his ADLs and high ADLs. His exam is pretty much unremarkable, except for the right elbow fracture and the fact that he's overweight. His laboratory values are listed there, where his uh, sodium is, is 134 and his BUN and creatinine, which is a marker of dehydration, is also 
is listed there as well. His EKG is unremarkable, showing a normal sinus rhythm. So for for the people who are who've had surgery before and have seen their their doctors before surgical procedures, your doctors probably did a cardiac risk assessment. How likely are you going to have a cardiac event prior when you go into surgery? So this gentleman has some risk factors already. He has cardiovascular risk factors such as his coronary artery disease, his high blood pressure, it's already there. So there's some risk that this gentleman has. And there's also some risk that's inherent in the surgical procedure itself, of course. But oftentimes doctors and, and also nurses forget to ask about, well, what's your risk for developing delirium? Because, as we talked about, it's associated with really poor clinical outcomes if you develop it. In a later slide and later in our discussion, we'll be talking more about this. It's far better to prevent delirium than let it happen and try to treat it. It's far better to prevent it from happening. Okay? So it's really important to talk about, well, what's your risk for developing delirium? Okay? And where we're going to draw some of, of the literature is actually looking at American Geriatric Society's uh, clinical practice guideline for post-operative delirium, particularly related to older adults. Okay? And we'll bring some of that literature into this, this discussion as well. Okay? But one of the more important things that we'll talk about and about the clinical practice guideline is that they bring up this difference in prevention versus treatment. And, and I think that is incredibly important, is that when you're talking about interventions, you need to ask yourself, are you talking about preventing delirium from happening? Or, it, or if you're treating delirium because it's already occurred. And then the, another important aspect that they bring out is talk about the severity of delirium is now that delirium has already occurred, can we minimize the severity of it? Or can we reduce the duration of it? Reduce the number of days that a person has is delirious. And then lastly, we talk about the potential harms because very similar to other um, studies in older adults, there's insufficient data. And so when you ask yourself, is there clinically effective data to support its use? Well, maybe there isn't. But is there any potential harm in using it as well? And so that's another important aspect of the clinical practice guidelines that, that the authors bring out is, are there any harms in doing what we're doing as well? Okay, Maybe it's not that there's no evidence to support its use in terms of clinical effectiveness, but is there any harm in it? Okay. So before we move on to that, this is a huge list of predisposing risk factors for developing delirium. Of course, this is a talk about delirium in older adults. So it's an advanced age. So pre-existing cognitive impairment as well is, one of, is a huge risk factor. Any history of neurodegenerative disease, such as Parkinson's or history of prior strokes. If you have comorbid conditions, and that just means that if you have any type of past medical history. If you have impaired vision or hearing, if you're on any CNS active medication, if you have any pre-existing functional impairments, and if you have a history of alcohol use, too. So there's a lot of risk factors that are out there, a lot of predisposing risk factors. But there's only a few that I want you to remember. There's only a few that I really want you to remember. And, and some of those risk factors are listed here. And this is from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which is really the, which is the equivalent of AHRQ in the UK. And they talk about four clinical risk factors that, are, that would be associated with moderate to high risk if any of these are present, any. Okay. So if you're over the age of 65, you're at risk. If you have cognitive impairment, past or present, you're at risk. If you have a hip fracture, you are at risk. And if you have a severe illness that you're being admitted to the hospital for, you're at risk. So any of these risk factors, you would be at risk for developing delirium, okay? And then the other risk factors, too, is, is um, these. And, and so this is actually developed by Sharon in a way, which is the developer of, of HELP, which we'll talk about later on, which are 
the interventions to, to treat delirium and to prevent delirium from happening. But what Sharon found was that there were four risk factors that, in, that were also very important. Um, and probably more important is that there was a decrease in person's vision. So if it was uh, poorer than 20 to 70, if there was severe illness. And in the original study, they measured severe illness using an Apache 2 score. I don't plan for anyone um, to, to actually find the calculator and measure that, but it, as defined as severe illness. If there was pre-existing decreasing cognition measured as a mini mental status score worse than 24. And if their BUN and creatinine was greater than 18 as well. And like we were talking about before, as a sign of dehydration. Right? And so you see that there are clinical overlaps, or there's overlaps in the clinical risk factors from this and this, right? So the severe illness, for example, the cognitive impairment. Is, is, is there as well. And so what Sharon found was that if you had zero items that were that are listed on this slide, you were at little to no risk for developing. And if you had one to two items, you were at an intermediate, intermediate risk. And three to four, you were at very high risk as for developing delirium. So coming back to the case in this gentleman, not only would a person do a cardiovascular risk assessment, well, what's his risk of having a heart attack for going into surgery? Well, what's also his risk for developing delirium after his, sur his surgery? And so this gentleman, did, regardless of what risk score you use, if you use the NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, or this delirium risk score that was developed by Sharon, in a way, he would be in intermediate risk of developing delirium in the hospital course. And the reason why this is so in, in important is that when we talk about preventing delirium later on, we're going to find out that it's incredibly time intensive. And it requires a lot of resources. So you can't do this for every single patient. Well, you can, but it requires a lot of resources. And so that's why you want to identify the people who have high risk or intermediate risk that will have the biggest benefit, rather than have, doing this intervention for someone who has low risk or no risk at all. Okay, So some tips for improving patient care is to risk stratify your patients, to think about those, those things. Is there a visual impairment that a person has? And that's all that I, I, I would suggest. Not to measure what their eye score is, if it's 2100 or 2070. Right? Is there a pre-existing um, decline in cognition, cognitive impairment? Is the patient severely ill? And what's their volume status? And typically, as a physician, I use the B to N to creatinine ratio. OK. Now, we'll move on to precipitating factors, right? And so before we were talking about predisposing factors, these are things that are inherent to that case, to this gentleman that had a fall and a uh, right elbow fracture. But then there's precipitating factors, too, that can, can cause delirium from happening. So a person can have an, an acute medical problem. They could have pain. They could have urinary retention. Um, and it could be the environment itself. By no means is this list meant to be comprehensive. But it's really important to think about those things, um, that it's a diagram between precipitating factors and predisposing factors. Because this next thing, uh, this next slide shows you that the um, precipitating risk factors, um, these are some of the highest ones out there that, that have been shown. The use of physical restraints actually increases delirium. Malnutrition, the number of medications. I think you guys had a polypharmacy talk right before this, um, uh, the, the prior one. And so adding medications, if more than three medications were added, and the use of Foley catheters has another form of restraint. All are precipitating risk factors for developing delirium. And this is what I was talking about before, is that, that somewhere along the lines is that there's high risk for high predisposing risk factors or high precipitating factors. And somewhere along the lines is that, that you're trying to minimize both of these things and get it back down to here. And so this is the relationships that, that I, I mentally picture when a person has delirium. Is, that a person has pre 
predisposing risk factors that I might not change, be able to change, but the precipitating factors as well. And you're trying to limit those as well. Coming back to the AGS clinical practice guidelines, there's a lot, there's many more precipitating factors out there that I'm just, that I lumped into a summary table for, for the audience. The type of anesthetic and the depth of anesthetic could be beneficial, but there's insufficient data to really, to, to, to recommend it as well. And then we talk about regional anesthesia as, as well. And so this is referred to a local block. So for example, if a person is going for knee surgery, can we give them, rather than a general anesthetic, can we give them a local block, just numb up that entire region? And so as, it, well, as you can see, is that the strength of the evidence is weak and the quality is low. But when you look at the harm, it's actually not so bad. There's very limited harm with its use. And so in some institutions, you'll see this much used much more frequently, which are regional blocks depending on what type of injury a person has. And then also pain as well. Not so much precipitating pain, but treating pain. The strength of the evidence is quite strong, and the quality is, is low. And of course, the harms that are associated with treating pain are inherent with the medications that's used. The opiates, the gabapentin, or the, N, the NSAIDs as well. And avoiding inappropriate um, medications, I'm sure Dr. Markham talked about this as, as well. The, the strength of the evidence is, is very strong and the quality is low. And I could say that there's very limited harm. And there's some data out there about prophylactic antipsychotic use. And AGS has come out to say that there's insufficient data to, to actually recommend it and the quality of it is low. And part of the reason being is that if, if you look at the literature that it's underpowered, it's mostly using Haldol, and it's mostly in the intensive care level of care. And when we're talking about all the interventions here on how to manage, or how to manage delirium in the older adult, we're not talking about in the intensive care unit. The intensive care unit is a different type of delirium, and it's a different level of acuity. And so most of the literature, when you're talking about prophylactic antipsychotic use before a person develops the condition using Haldol, it's mostly done in the intensive care unit. And so that's why I think it's not easily extractable and usable for many of us who don't practice in the intensive care unit, in, in well, intensive care units. And it's also a variable dosing. It ranges anywhere from 0 0.5 milligrams IV bolus followed by a continuous infusion and continuous infusion for 12 hours versus five milligrams every to six hours up to 14 days. So incredibly variable in, ter in terms of how Haldol is used. And so that's why you see that there's insufficient strength to recommend really its use. And of course, the, the harms are numerous as outlined here. Okay? And that, that we'll also talk about in a little bit. So what to do if, if, uh, if we can't use Haldol or we shouldn't use Haldol? What I'm going to talk to you about is HELP. And HELP is an acronym that is developed by Sharon in a way, and it's called the Hospital Elder Life Program. What it showed was that they reduced the incident development of delirium by nearly 5% compared to its control. The number needed to treat was 20. And what that means is that you needed to treat for every single um, case uh, that you had to treat 20 patients using this intervention to prevent one case of delirium. That number needed to treat is actually pretty good. But the unfortunate thing with, with the original study that was developed in 1999 was that once delirium occurred, that there was no statistical benefit to using help. So the biggest bang for your buck the best evidence for its use is prevention. And that's what I was stressing before. And so that's why it's important to, to identify people who are at higher, most at risk for developing delirium so that you can intervene upon it before it happens. But what it did show, though, it reduced the total number of delirium episodes and days with delirium. And more importantly, as a geriatrician, it also reduced functional decline. 
as well. And so given all this data, it makes sense that it also was able to reduce cost, hospital costs as well. What is help? It's these six interventions. It's not rocket science. It makes sense. So, and we'll talk about each one of these in detail. So they had a, a cognitive impairment protocol. They had a protocol to address immobility. They had a protocol to address visual impairment and also hearing impairment. They had a protocol to address sleep. And they also had a protocol to address dehydration and malnutrition as well. So these six protocols comp comprised help. Okay. So the cognitive impairment, well, what was it? So when a person was hospitalized, an older adult was hospitalized, what the cognitive protocol was is that they had a daily, daily visitor. And they also educated the staff to orient the staff. Hello, Mrs. Jones, you are in the hospital. Today is March the 1st, and it's 2016, and you're at Harborview. Not only did they orient the, them, that there was a schedule, a bulletin board, that it would bright, a, a big dry eraser board that actually had the date and also um, the schedule of the upcoming events of what that, that patient was supposed to anticipate. And so many of your hospitals that you practice at probably have this. And so I make it a point to actually change those dates. Okay, and, and so, so make sure that, that those things are updated. But also included within the cognitive impairment are the therapeutic activities as, as well. So patients aren't there left staring at the ceiling and counting the number of holes that are in the tiles. And, and so they had volunteers that were present to discuss the current events. And if a person had baseline dementia, they had structured reminiscent therapy. And so if a person was demented and thought it was in the, that they, it was 1960s, guess what? They didn't orient them and say, hey, you know, it's, not, it's 2016. You're totally wrong because that just increases the anxiety level. And so they did structured therapy with those individuals. Well, if you think it's 1960s, let's go back in time with you. What's going on? Let's talk about your family. And, they, and for those individuals who had, had the abilities, they did word games, word searches as, as well. So there was some sort of stimulation three times a day. That was the cognitive impairment. Okay? Not rocket science, not rocket science. They focused on mobilizing people early. So they ambulated people three times a day. And for those individuals who weren't able to ambulate for whatever reason, they did range of motion of large joints three, three times a day. That's it. And so they minimized the use of, of other things that could be considered restraints. So not only purely restraints, but maybe forward catheters that we talked about as, as well. And for people who had vision impairment, they actually had visual aids. So if a person came in and was hospitalized and they had their glasses on, uh, and they brought their glasses with them, they made sure that the glasses were on when the patients were awake. And if they didn't have their glasses, a magnifying lens was given to them so that they could read for the cognitive stimulation that we had talked about. And then there was also adaptive equipment that, that, that the system had purchased specifically for the protocol. So I don't know how many of you have been hospitalized before, but it's incredibly hard to find the call light and the phone at night. So what they had were these large keypad telephones that, I, that actually lit up. And there was a fluorescent tape that was taped across the call bell so that late at night when it was dark, you could actually find it. And there's a large print books that, that was, was provided for people with low vision or, as well. And there was daily reinforcement of the use above by staff members as well. And for those people with a hearing impairment, there was a hearing protocol. So if during the interview that the healthcare provider, the nurse, or the, visas, the physician saw that they had um, hearing impairment, they did a really novel thing. They looked in the ears. Yeah, they looked in the ears with an otoscope. And if there was earwax, they removed it. Yeah, the disimpact, and yeah, how novel was that, right? And so, so and, and this is actually supported by studies if, that an incredible, if an incredibly impacted ear by earwax can reduce the decibels by 20. And it's a log scale, so that 20 decibels is incredibly important to be able to hear. 
And if a person still had hearing impairment after the earwax was removed, then a um, pocket talker was provided. And, um, and for those of you who don't know what a pocket talker is, is it amplifies the ambient noise. It's the size of the business card, and um, the patient wears headphones, and the headphones are connected to this amplifying device. And there's a mic at the end of it that, that, that amplifies. Uh, much cheaper than losing a set of hearing aids that are uh, in the hospitalized setting. And so um, that's what was provided. Pretty novel, right? Rocket science, I'm telling you. The other thing that they did was that there was an oral volume re uh, repletion and feeding and f fluid assistance. So they had volunteers that went around to encourage individuals to actually drink and to eat. And at least at Harborview, they've actually incorporated many of some of the, these components of help that were, uh, um, within the systems. And so we actually have volunteers, and this might be present in your hospitals too, late in the afternoon, actually pushing a cart filled with water around and asking and patients if they're thirsty. And so encouraging feeding and fluid intake was one of the protocols. And the last thing that they did was a sleep protocol because what they wanted to do, these researchers did, is that they wanted to reduce the use of sedative hypnotics because it's so linked to the incident um, delirium. So what they did was before you could ask for a sedative hypnotic to help you to, to sleep, you had to ask for these three things stepwise. First, you had to ask for a warm drink. And Preferably, you had to ask for a warm glass of milk. But if you were lactose intolerant, then you could have herbal tea and a warm glass of herbal tea. Okay? And if you were still awake at that point, once you were done with your drink, then you could listen to a relaxation tape to, of, of, of your choice. If you were still awake at that point, then you were offered a back rub. And if you were still awake at that point, then you could use your sedative hypnotic. So these researchers actually looked at the sleep protocol as a separate entity within a single hospitalized setting. And they showed that, that um, they were able to reduce the use of sedative hypnotics by 30%. Amazing, right? Just by doing this. Amazing, right? And my take home message is help works, but this is the most important message that I want to convey to you. Help not only works, but it's a dose-response relationship. If you do all six interventions, you got the full bang, that you got the full value. So you got the 5% reduction. But if you could only do two out of the four, you got some, as well, or two out, out of the six, you got some, not as many as four. So that's what I would encourage you to think about is that it's a dose-response relationship. So how I incorporate this into my clinical practice is this. You can see that it's incredibly time in intensive. I'm going to go back a couple of slides. It's incredibly time intensive to do this. But what I encourage to many of, of what I encourage to many of the students and the medical residents that I work with is that it's a dose response curve. You don't have to do all six of these. And oftentimes it's a systems based approach. The hospital systems should be taking care of this and should be doing many of these things. But if you were able in your daily morning interactions when the medical student goes to see the patient, you can do the cognitive portion. If you orient them and you push the food tray closer to them and you encourage that fluid intake. And I do the same thing when I come and see them in the afternoon. And we encourage the family members at bedside to do the same. We just kind of did the intervention. Right? And, and you don't need a physical a PT degree to range of motion, large joints. Right? You don't need an RN to be able to do that. If a family member was present, you can actually do that. And so I'm going back to, what, to this is that try to incorporate as many of these things into your clinical practice as you can because it's a dose response curve. And part of this is the education components and spreading the word on help, which is visualized here. There's all these messages that are popping up 
uh, here that I, that I can't answer all at once. One was, well, what is help? Um, and so rather than backing up and, and, and talking about what help is, I'm displaying this for you. Um, and hopefully we can address that later, but it was already discussed. Okay. And so it makes complete sense that it's a dose response curve because this is what geriatric medicine is. And so you've heard about geriatric syndromes, meaning that there's a lot of different things that contribute to a person's phenotype. There's a lot of things that, that present why a person has fall, being a prototypical geriatric syndrome. And this slide tries to capture that. But the same thing could be said about delirium, a cognitive impairment. Right? And so I could substitute falls there for delirium, just likewise. And that's the whole concept, is that it's a dose response curve. And it's one of the rare geriatric syndromes that has shown a dose response curve. So we want to reduce falls, and we address all these things. But in fact, we actually don't know if it's a dose response curve. We don't know if changing the environmental factors or changing their footwear can actually have, have an additive effect. But at least with delirium, we do know that if you implement help, it's actually a dose response curve. So it's a great example of um, a geriatric syndrome and that it also has an intervention that really is clinically effective as well. And so what does AGS talk about is that is this, is that this is what they recommend is the clinical practice guideline for preventing delirium, is that you address people's pain. Use medications appropriately. Adequate oxygenation to tissues, which we'll talk about a little bit. Prevent constipation as well. And what they also talk about is that the multi-component non-pharmacologic intervention. That's what help is. It's a multi-component non-pharmacologic intervention. And when they break it down to preventing delirium, the strength is strong, the quality is moderate. But when you talk about the management of delirium, once delirium has already occurred, the strength of its use becomes a little bit more weaker and the quality is a little bit lower. And the harms are really cost and the staff time because that's a, a very valuable um, harm to consider is that you're taking away from something else that that person could be doing or that team could be doing. Okay. Let me just check on time. And so this is a summary of all the non-pharmacologic management for delirium. On the left-hand side are the interventions that we talked about for help. And on the right-hand side are some other interventions as well that we, we're not going to delve into in much detail. Because I think that each one of these could be separate discussions um, that we already talked about. I'll talk about a couple of other things that we didn't mention before that some studies have showed that having a geriatrician um, consult on your patients within the hospital setting and review their clinical case has been shown to reduce delirium. And also, more importantly, what we're doing right now is education. Education has also been shown to reduce delirium as well. Okay. So what about interventions preventing delirium in the long-term care setting, because that's where I also practice. And I, sadly enough, there's only two trials, two trials, can you believe that, that have been shown to really, uh, to really look at delirium. And so this was a Cochrane database uh, review of um, interventions in preventing delirium in the long-term care setting. So if you're a nursing student or you're a medical student or any individual that is out there that is listening that are incredibly interested in, in this, um, the long-term care environment is ripe for research. So there's been only two interventions out, out there and they are listed here. So the researchers frankly state, as this review found a very small number of research studies, recommended that further research should be conducted testing different ways of preventing delirium of older people living in the long-term care environment. So very limited um, literature in the long-term care.
So what I would advocate for is to initiate interventions for those at most higher risk to prevent delay. Prevention, by far, is much more effective than once it already happened. So we're going to continue with our case two. And so this is just recall, because we take a long uh, divergent uh, road to talking about help. But our case was a gentleman who had a ground level fall with a right elbow fracture. So his surgery, unfortunately, is delayed. And on hospital day number two, he has pain with his movement. And unfortunately, he's fallen asleep during your interview again. And the RN staff reports no issues overnight, but he's sleeping really quiet, really. And his exam is, is noted there. And unfortunately, he's more lethargic and has poor inspiratory effort. And his neurological exam is non-focal, suggesting that he has not had a stroke. His sodium is a little bit lower than, than before. And so what this case really illustrates is that the hypoactive delirium. And the reason why this case is important is that the far majority of delirium is in the hypoactive arena. And they, that's why it goes under-recognized. This is why it's never called. Family members don't call. Nurses don't call for, for this because usually people are sleeping. They're quote unquote comfortable. Right? But in actuality, they flip back and forth between the two. That a person can have hyperactivity and they can be hypoactive, but by far, hypoactive delirium is the most common versus the hyperactivity that we had talked about, the signs and the symptoms there um, that we often refer to in terms of, del of delirium. Okay. So I'm going to ask a question here. And by, by no means am I looking for an answer, but it's just to stimulate your, some thoughts. So you have an 84-year-old woman who has Alzheimer's disease, is also a diabetic, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. She lives in a assisted living facility, but she's become increasingly agitated, especially at night for the past week now. She's climbing out of bed, and on one occasion, she's actually had a fall, sustaining a bruise to her hip. The assisted living facility staff report that she's been a poor sleeper since she's been admitted to the assisted living facility 18 months earlier. But otherwise, she's usually cooperative and cheerful during the daytime. She appears really fearful and complains of criminals coming into her room and at night to attack her. So a little bit of that paranoia. And so which of the following is the best initial management? Use side rails at her bed at night. Music therapy in the evening to kind of calm her. Asking to do a physical exam and routine labs. Treatment of her hip pain because she has a fall with some time on for use of bright light therapy to improve sleep? And your answer is C. And this really comes back to my initial slide of the DSM-4 criteria. You're looking for an inorganic cause. So this is an, an abrupt change in this woman because you want to find out, well, what's caused that abrupt change? And this is an algorithm to go through that, really. And so it's one of, one of a, two handfuls of clinical conditions that you would try to evaluate and manage patients all at the same time. And so this is what that initial slide talked about, is to do a physical exam, take a good history, trying to find the reason why the person is delirious. And in terms of the management, we'll kind of talk about, too, is that when a person is not agitated, when they're not posing a risk to themselves or to the staff members, then talk about non pharmacologic treatment. But when they're posing a risk to themselves, to injury, or to also staff members, then you're thinking about pharmacologic treatment and also not pharmacologic treatment. Okay? So when I'm trying to assess, well, what are some of the causes? Unfortunately, there's not a gold standard. There's not an algorithm that, that I could feed a person into. And so it needs to be individualized for that patient because every single 84-year-old that I see, they're incredibly different and heterogeneous. They carry different comorbid conditions and different medications. And, and so that's what I'm trying to do, is find an individualized reason why they are delirious. And very, very few studies have looked at the etiologies. But the most important thing, though, is to have some sort of systematic approach. There's multiple mnemonics out there and, and algorithms to, to look at. Um, but I'll share with you a couple that, that I think of, okay? 
And again, this comes back to delirium being a geriatric syndrome. What I will, will, will add to that previous diagram is that the size of these arrows suggests that there's different levels of impact. So for example, at least with this case of delirium, these are the six things that could contribute to this person being delirious. But maybe the environment has a much greater impact than the immobility that a person has. And medications comes into second as well. And so you're trying to alter and mitigate some of these risk factors, trying to improve delirium or reduce the severity of it as well. Okay. And the reason being is that when researchers did look at, well, how many causes of delirium excuse me, how many things can cause delirium per case? On average, it was close to three. So three different causes per case of delirium. So my take home message is, if you think of one, keep looking, because there's two others out there that can have a possible impact on delirium. And the, the other thing too that I had talked about is to have a systematic approach. This is my mnemonic, and it's often taught. Many of you might already know it. But D standing for drugs. And by far, that is the number thing, the number one that I look at, is what medications were recently started. Not only do I look at what medicines were started, but I also look at, at withdrawal of medicines. What medicines were stopped? I'm taking care of people uh, uh, within a nursing home, for example. I receive patients from the hospital in the post-acute care setting. So it's really important to me to know what medications they were on prior to they were hospitalized. Because it could have been a CNS active medication such as a antidepressant and it was stopped because they were acutely altered. It was never started. Now they're delirious at my nursing home. And so they might be going through withdrawal. And so it's important to think about withdrawal symptoms as well. And the other thing to think about is also alcohol. And so you could put that under E as, as, as well. Just because an individual is older doesn't mean that they don't drink. And so assessing alcohol as well. The E stands for ears and eyes. This speaks more about the sensory impairment and the environment. Is understanding and being empathetic when an older adult with sensory impairment is placed to an environment that is unfamiliar to them, that the environment itself can have a huge impact upon a precipitating factor for delirium. Um, and then there's a low o O2 states, meaning that there's not, not enough oxygen delivery to any type of organ. So ACS stands for acute coronary, so a person could have a, being having a heart attack. They could have a blood clot to their lung or a clot in their brain to cause a stroke. So the list goes, goes on to any type of um, lack of oxygen to a specific organ. I stands for infection uh, there, pneumonia. Uh, urinary source as well. And particularly if a person comes from an adult family home or from a nursing home, you, you want to do a nice thorough skin exam to looking for pressure ulcers as being another sign of a possible source of infection. R standing for retention of not only urine but also stool as well and also restraints. Um, I standing for post-ictal states. So maybe they had a seizure and now they're that it's after their seizure that they're having confusion. The U stands for a hodgepodge of things under nutrition and hydration. So not getting enough food and not getting enough water and undertreated pain as, as well as being a possible cause. And M standing for metabolic, so high low levels of calcium, high low levels of, of uh, glucose, and high low, level, low, low levels of sodium as well can cause acute changes um, as well. And also the last thing that I'm looking for within the clinical history is a subdural. And similar to our case of the woman with it in the assisted living facility, the clinical history is that a person had a fall and it was unwitnessed and might have had some head injury three to four days later that they are acutely delirious and that's an involving subdural within their brain. The list here isn't for you to memorize, but it's all just so that for those of you who are interested, to be systematic in your approach because there's more than one cause. Usually. Okay, so in our in a different case, a family of an 82-year-old uh, nursing home resident reports that she seems uh, 
more confused compared to the previous evening. The staff reports and confusion seems to vary through the day, so capturing the fluctuating course. There's been uh, no decrease in her appetite. Past medical history is consistent for Alzheimer's dementia, atrial fibrillation, depression, and osteoarthritis. Her medications there is digoxin, uh, warfarin, cumin, and fluoxetine, also known as Prozac, that was added four months ago, and ibuprofen that was added a month ago. Her physical exam is located there, which is noted for that she's bradycardic. The take-home message here is that medications are the culprit here. Is, is that there's something that is abnormal, but taking a good thorough history of the medication history is important. And so oftentimes, I review medicines with a, uh, very, very closely. The list that you have in front of you is not meant to be comprehensive, but these are some of the medications that have high anticholinergic activity. But any anticholinergic medications can contribute. The ones that are highlighted, the benzodiazepines, um, you might be familiar with some of them, lorazepam, for example, um, are uh, culprits, and also diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl, are, are culprits as well that I review for. And researchers have looked at other medications as well, because we're all afraid of treating pain as well. And so many of you would say, well, under treatment of pain can cause delirium. How about using opiates? You know, because treating pain can also cause it. So I tell you, clinically, it's a fine balance that, well, that you try to walk. But researchers actually have looked at opiates and, and the medications that can, uh, are at risk for developing delirium in older adults. And what they have shown or what they have found is opiates are unequivocal, like that, that it's not actually shown to increase the risk of developing delirium when you use opiates. But one of the medications that consistently are benzodiazepines. And so I definitely try to avoid using benzos um, in older adults in treating delirium. And what do I do as a physician? These are the typical things that I would order looking for all those things that, that we talked about. Calcium level, basic metabolic panel, looking at a renal function, and also sodium. I'm doing a CBC just to make sure that um, there's no infections or signs of infection. I'm doing a drug levels, too, if they're on medications that I can measure drug levels in. I'm doing a utox, just in case th that it was um, toxicity, particularly in the patients that, that I see. Uh, for substance abuse, urine culture and urine for infection, chest x-ray to look for a pulmonary infection, and lastly an EKG, trying to assess their heart function. Because common things being common, is it a heart attack that they're presenting with? Another question. So you have a frail 90-year-old, 91-year-old woman who has Alzheimer's dementia. Her mini mental status score is 12 out of 30. She is sent into the nursing home, or sent to the emergency room from the nursing home for severe agitation. In the past few days, she's very irritable. She's pacing, and now she's threatening to hit others, particularly the other residents in the nursing home. She's having trouble sleeping and says others are trying to harm her, evidence of paranoia. A few hours ago, unfortunately, she punched another resident in the nursing home. That's why she's been sent to the emergency room. She's cooperative, but after being placed in the room, she gets out of the bed and walks the hall, screaming. When she's redirected back to her room, she insists to go home, but she listens and will not cooperate with the testing that the physicians want to do. So what's the most appropriate next step? Administer lorazepam? No. After what we talked about? Thank you. Administer Haldol? Not yet. Request a nurse for a one-to-one -one time with her? Administer olanzapine, which is another antipsychotic, or restrain the patient to obtain a blood and urine workup. So the answer here is C, is, is to request a nurse for one-to-one -one time with, with her at this point. And the reason being that the other choices aren't really ideal. We talked about lorazepam already. These other two aren't, or excuse me, E isn't ideal, the use of restraints, because I think we had talked about it actually making 
delirium worse. But the reason why B and D aren't as well is that at, right at this point, she's not a threat to staff or others at this point. But also that there's actually a black label box warning for the use of antipsychotics, particularly with people who have dementia, that it increases the risk of mortality in older adults. And this is not only for the conventional antipsychotics such as Haldol, but also the atypical ones too. And so when I use an antipsychotic, there should be some discussion about the pros and cons of it being used because there's definitely a black box warning that's associated with increased risk of mortality that's associated with its use, particularly in people with dementia. Okay. So how do you navigate in managing patients with dementia uh, with this new psychosis and aggression? You ask yourself, well, how dangerous is that situation? And if they are posing a threat, then that's a good time to use an antipsychotic. And to try to establish well, why <clears throat> a person is delirious, again, getting back to, well, why are they agitated at this point? And try to establish the symptom severity and also this frequency, particularly its impact upon caregivers. And I think this is one of the more important things that, that I assess, particularly when a person lives at home. When delirium sets in, in the community setting, which we haven't talked much about, because it's rare, um, but it's still present, is that it's an impact upon caregivers and family members. And establishing, well, what is your goal at this point? And, and having a very clear discussion about the severity of the, the symptom. And then to explore the past treatments and the caregiver strategies that have worked within the past. And, and so, for example, in our discussion with, uh, or in that case that we talked about where that, that woman had punched a nursing home resident, calling over to the nursing and well, how do you approach this woman in the past? And getting that feedback from the staff that might be very familiar with her could be very beneficial. And then, like we were talking about, discuss also with the patient and the decision maker as well. Okay. So in the acute use of antipsychotics, there's very limited randomized control trials. Believe it or not, many of them are extrapolations from other populations that we typically don't think about. And they're in HIV patients uh, who are at end of life and they're old, or they're in nursing home patients, for example. So there's very little evidence that any one antipsychotic is more effective than another. It's mostly based upon where you practice at and what your formulary is, for the most part. And what you have here is a comparison of the typical antipsychotics and the atypical ones. Uh, a comparison between the two, and this is sedation, uh, comparing the two. BP stands for blood pressure drop, oops, sorry. EPS stands for extrapyramidal side uh, symptoms, and these are motor symptoms. QTC is prolongation of the, a heart rhythm that can increase a person's mortality. And metabolic effects usually talks about either the risk of developing uh, diabetes or dyslipidemia as well. Okay. What I would advocate for is if you do have to use an antipsychotic, is to use the lowest effective dose. And, and I don't think that as a provider we talk about this as frequently. And for the nursing uh, individuals who are, are on the call is if you do request the use of Haldol, also request the stop time. For example, here is Haldol, 0 0.5 milligrams, POQHS. Put a stop date on it for seven days. Is because with the fragmented healthcare system that, that we're, we're practicing in, there's shifts of doctors that are on, for example. And these medications get prolongedly used, and they get discharged. Patients get discharged to, to it within the nursing home. And in the nursing home, then you're reassessing them. Sometimes they get discharged to home with as, as well. And so it's actually recommended as a, a clinical practice guideline by NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, is to put a stop date on it, for it to automatically drop off, and then for it to be renewed if it's really needed at that point. Okay. We'll talk about a specific population in the last five minutes here, and I'll open it up to 
um, discussion. And this is uh, a topic and discussion of end of life care and delirium. So you have an 82 year old woman who is a resident and adult family home. She is on hospice with a diagnosis of dementia. Her FAST score is 7C, which means that she's, non, uh, she's not able to communicate and she is not walking. Her palliative performance score is about 40% and is being just seen routinely. You note that she appears to be sleeping comfortably and she opens her eyes to her name and falls back asleep during your assessment. The adult family home owner caregiver states that she barely stays awake in the, for the past three days and, it's, and she's now having to have fully assisted meals where before she was able to kind of feed herself with finger foods. So are you worried in this case? Because this is very similar to many of the things that we talked about. This is an abrupt change, and maybe she's delirious. And so what we'll talk about a little bit is the distinction between delirium versus terminal agitation, or also known as terminal delirium or terminal restlessness. And so delirium is what we talked about. It's some sort of medical condition with some sort of diagnostic criteria. It's very similar to the DSM-5 criteria that we talked about. But terminal delirium really refers to kind of a clinical spectrum of behaviors and symptoms that you see in the last few days of life. But there's a lot of overlap between the two because many people can have delirium, have it resolve, and be pretty much status quo, then have another case of delirium, then die. And only in retrospect are you able to determine that, oh, maybe that was terminal delirium. There's some other signs that are associated with, with it too, that a person is in, in the life. And so hopefully you can find those signs. But sometimes it's only in retrospect that we recognize that it's terminal delirium as well. Okay. And so these are all the different pathways to, to death that are associated with hyperactive delirium, hypoactive delirium. Fortunately, like we were talking about, Hypoactive delirium is the most common, even within end-of-life care. So people become more sleepy, lethargic, obtunded, semi-comatose, comatose, and then they die. Right? Very similar to our case that we just talked about, with that woman being in an adult family home. But the troubled road, or the difficult road, is the hyperactive one, where that a person is restless, confused, climbing out of beds. Um, they have hallucinations, paranoia, very, very stressful to family and care, care, caregivers. And they start having myoclonic jerking because, um, because it's a sign of end of life and they might even have seizures. Then ultimately they become semi-comatose. What to do in that sense? Well, this is incredibly uh, busy, but I just want you to look at this. This is where I think it is the most important thing is to have that goals of care discussion. What are your priorities at this point with someone who has hyperactive delirium? Are you worried about the increased risk of mortality about using antipsychotics? Maybe not. Probably not. And so that's a good indication for its use of your priorities to keep your loved one at home. And so having this discussion early on, which is the goals of care, is having, well, what are our goals? What are your priorities? In that sets the tone for everything else downstream from that. And so that's what I would encourage you to do, particularly associated with this. And why does it matter? Because it's incredibly common, like we were talking about in, in, in our initial slide. Nearly a third of patients have delirium at the time that they are admitted to hospice. Ultimately, many, many people will have it. If you look back at that slide of, of the usual pathway to death, and sometimes it's re even reversible in patients who have hospice, who are on hospice even. And there's a huge impact in terms of the quality of life too. Like we were talking about, increased mortality might not be the worst thing. But this, I think, is unrecognized, that there's a huge impact in terms of fair, uh, the family members and the caregivers. Because there's, there's a high psychological distress when they're at home or even in the hospital setting. Um, where they're seeing their family member being altered, not behaving like themselves. Um, so there's a huge impact upon that. Okay. So these are my clinical pearls that I w wish to to impart upon you in my last slide. 
Delirium is often not recognized. So look for it using a standardized um, tool of your choice. Prevention, again, is critical. Think of non-pharmacologic interventions. They are effective. And think of help, because it was a dose response curve. Review their medications. Assess for pain and treat the pain. Assess hydration and uh, constipation. Look for underlying causes. And if you find one, keep looking. And if, I, if antipsychotics are needed, then use, the, use the lowest effective dose and the, for a short duration as well. Okay. I'm going to stop here for questions in the last 10 minutes. Great. And, Sure, yeah. So I, I'm going to, so the, the question from one of the audience is to please review what H-E-L-P uh, stands for. And it stands for Hospital Elder Life Program, and it's the non-pharmacologic interventions that we had talked about. Um, and I, let me advance my slides to get there. And there are six of them out there and they are and they are the six. Okay. And then I had a question in the audience here. And please when you get questions in this audience if you could repeat them so I shall catches yeah. in the recording. So the, the question is, is delirium distressing for the patients in, on hospice? Uh, because sometimes it feels like we're treating the family member rather than purely the patient. Um, it depends on what type of delirium that individual has. And it gets back to, do they pose um, a safety risk? Right. Um, and let me give, give you a prototypical example, hyperactive delirium that it could be stressful um, that for the patient and not only for the family member. So the example is that a person is delirious, they're on hospice, but they perceive that they have the ability to walk and they're trying to climb out of bed. And that poses a great amount of, of caregiving on the, the family member. But they have to be vigilant 24 hours, seven days a week on that patient. And so that poses a huge amount of, of stress, physical and emotional as, as well. And so that's where the, it can be distressful for the patient as well, is that they can injure themselves, for example. Um, but now that they can also be placed into an institutional environment as well, because now you're experiencing caregiver burden. And, and so that's where I think that having the goals of care and talking about what the priorities are in the management of this end of life, because it's incredibly individualized. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, what kinds of respite programs are available for at-home caregivers? You know, uh, that's a good question that, that I wish that there was, um, we were on our web and that we could talk to a social worker. But I do know that King County has a, King County here in the Seattle area um, has a um, respite program. Um, I know hospice, if an individual is on hospice, there is respite for that too. Um, so um, you get five days every benefit period. Um, so those are the ones that I'm aware of. And so I'm not sure where your question, uh, where this question about respite came from. But I would check with your social worker. And Missoula is asking if a patient has been on benzos for a long time, is there a different protocol for treatment? That is a great, great question. Um, and so if a person is acutely delirious, um, what I clinically would do is to start tapering medicines. Uh, and so, for example, uh, if a person got admitted to the hospital and they were on CNS active meds, particularly benzos, that, about that you're talking about, I will take the liberty of slowly tapering off the benzos because it just clouds the clinical picture of is this contributing to it. Um, and so I, so I, so the management would be different in the sense that I would be tapering it rather than just abruptly stopping. 
Are there questions from the sites or here in the room? Yeah, there's, there's an additional question here. Yeah. Good. So the what the question is um, is the mechanism of action known of the increased mortality with the use of antipsychotics in patients with dementia, and and it's hypothesized that it's prolonged QT. So it creates an irregular uh, rhythm within the heart, and it's also hypothesized that it's related to having more cerebral vascular events, so strokes, and so it's hypothesized. Any other questions? I don't see that anyone's oh, Well, there's one, one more within the audience. Go ahead. So is, is there something if you catch it earlier and treat it earlier, there's better outcomes? Is there a... For a delirium, yes. you mean? So, so, so the question is, uh, is, is this if you catch it earlier, treat it earlier, are there better, better outcomes? The answer is yes. Yeah, and so if you're able to prevent it from happening, then yes, there's better outcomes compared to delirium and compared to having delirium. And prevention is really hard to prove. It's like receiving a flu shot, right? You know, like, well, you receive a flu shot and you prevented the flu from happening, but how do you know that it really worked or prevented anything? And, and so I think that, that that's the difficulty for some people. But at least in randomized control trials, when you compared the intervention versus the placebo, meaning that the standard of care that was being provided, it reduced delirium, better functional outcomes as well. And so, yes, prevention is better. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.